Evidence-Based Clinical Psychopharmacology Journal Club. I'm Dr. Leslie Citrom. I'm a clinical professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at New York Medical College in Valhalla, New York. My disclosures are on this slide. I serve as a consultant and speaker for many different pharmaceutical companies and also earn some income through royalties and, and publishing. Today's featured paper is the safety and effectiveness of Eulodorant, SCP-363856, in schizophrenia, results of a six-month open-label extension study. The first author is Christoph Carell. Professor Carell will be joining us shortly to discuss uh, issues uh, or uh, aspects about this paper that would be of interest to us clinically. So who is Christoph Carell? For those who don't know, he's a professor and chair of the Department of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at the Charité in Berlin, and also professor of psychiatry at the Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell, New York. Uh, and he completed his medical studies in Berlin as well as in Scotland. He has made a career in the identification and treatment of youth and adults with severe mental illness. He's been involved in many clinical trials and has published extensively regarding psychopharmacology, including a variety of meta-analyses. And he examines the interface between physical health and mental health as well. He's authored or co-authored over 800 journal articles that have been cited close to 60,000 times. He's received many, many research awards for his work. His H index, which is a, a metric that measures uh, one's influence in the literature, is very high, 127, triple digits, very unusual. So uh, we look forward to having uh, Dr. Carell with us uh, and answering questions that we have. So let's start off by talking about schizophrenia and what we've known about schizophrenia so far. For over half a century, we thought that psychosis basically stems from hyperactivation of the dopaminergic mesolimbic pathway. And that uh, leads to auditory hallucinations and paranoid delusions, for example. We've known for some time that this mesolimbic pathway projects from the ventrotegmental area to the ventral striatum of our brains. It's thought that the dorsal striatum is not affected by this hyperactivity because it's innervated through the nigrostriatal pathway. And so this led for uh, the development of, of many agents for the treatment of schizophrenia that will treat hallucinations and delusions and uh, also by blocking dopamine receptors as we'll soon see lead to motoric adverse events because it's not possible to just target one part of this system. There is a new dopamine story though that complicates things a little bit and through modern neuroimaging techniques, we find that humans are quite different from the animal models that were used in the past in terms of these different pathways that go from here to there. And it turns out that there is a nigrostriatal pathway that actually goes to, from the substantia nigra, that goes to something called the associative striatum, which can now uh, be thought of as the seat of, of psychosis. This is quite different from what we thought before with the mesolimbic pathway, but it's still there, that mesolimbic pathway. It's a little confusing uh, because uh, these pathways, uh, you know, will explain aspects about psychosis that uh, don't lend itself to a neat little story. So we have negative symptoms that are explanatory by one pathway, positive symptoms by another pathway, but we know that there's also the very important influence of another pathway, the mesocortical pathway. So it's quite complex. Uh, all these pathways end in dopamine receptors uh, being activated or not. And we've known uh, for years that blocking postsynaptic dopamine D2 receptors in particular leads to a reduction in psychotic symptoms. The first commercially available antipsychotic clopromazine blocks these postsynaptic dopamine D2 receptors, reducing the intensity of frequency of hallucinations and delusions. And all our antipsychotics since clopromazine do exactly the same thing in terms of blockade of D2. They do other things too, in terms of uh, other receptor binding affinities, including serotonin, 5-HT2A receptors, and so on. But all roads essentially have led to these dopamine receptors up to now. And the question is, is there another way to modulate dopamine and hence treat schizophrenia? 
and modulating dopamine in all those different pathways that we just talked about. So it's rather complex. We have a variety of, of new pathways to consider, and uh, we need to see if we can actually influence these circuits a little bit differently, presynaptically instead of postsynaptically. So trace amines and trace amine receptors is the subject of today's journal club. But first off, we need to answer the question, what are trace amines and what are trace amine associated receptors? Well, trace amines are endogenous chemical messengers uh, that exist in our brains, and they're termed as false neurotransmitters because although they are located in neurons, they're not released into the synapse in the way of a true neurotransmitter, such as dopamine, for example. When a neuron fires, a true neurotransmitter is released into the synapse. But this is not what happens with these trace amines. They're in there, but they don't re they're not sent into the synapse when the neuron fires. They look similar to dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin, the monoamine neurotransmitters, these trace amines. And in invertebrates, they actually serve as true neurotransmitters. Now, they're called trace because in mammals, for example, they're expressed at levels that are at least a hundredfold lower than the corresponding neurotransmitters that we're used to talking about. So a hundred times lower than the concentrations of dopamine and norepinephrine and, and serotonin, for example. Now I mentioned in invertebrates, they serve as true neurotransmitters. So it's interesting. And evolutionarily, uh, uh, it's interesting to see how uh, different uh, neurotransmitters have emerged amongst uh, different life forms on earth. And, uh, you know, well, we can speculate, uh, you know, how, how this happened. Uh, and we do know that in some invertebrates, they're quite intelligent too. So kind of interesting. And it piqued my interest in, in looking some of this stuff up. So trace amines are new for us in psychiatry, and uh, they will serve as uh, perhaps an avenue to treat psychiatric disorders if modulated in, in quite the, in the right way. So trace amine associated receptors exist in our brains. And in 2001, trace amines were found to selectively activate them. And so it's relatively recent discovery. Now these receptors are intracellular and uh, they, they are not uh, you know, your typical uh, receptors that we expect to find on, on cell membranes, for example, that are activated when a neurotransmitter is released from a neuron and that whole story. Uh, this is different. An intracellular receptor will modulate neurotransmission in a different way. The most studied trace amine associated receptor is TAR1. So this is brand new information to many of us, and it, it takes a while for all this to sink in. But the consequences of the discovery of trace amines and trace amine associated receptors is that it opened up an avenue of perhaps treating psychiatric disorders. Because when we look at the localization of trace amine receptors, remember we, uh, they're predominantly intracellular, they're found actually pre and postsynaptically in neurons of interest to us. And what they can do is, is form heterodimers with other receptors. So what does that mean? Well, the trace amine receptor can combine with a dopamine receptor. And when this happens, it will modify the function of that dopamine receptor and perhaps uh, altering the modulation of dopamine signaling so that we can perhaps reduce dopamine signaling where we need to reduce it and perhaps reduce hallucinations and delusions. Eulodoron is a trace amine receptor agonist and it's been studied in phase two clinical trials, which we'll talk about, and is currently in phase three of, of clinical development by Synovion and, and Otsuka for the treatment of schizophrenia. Now, Eulodorant is not only a trace amine receptor type one agonist, it also has serotonin 5-HT1A agonist activity. The phase two studies that were done in people with schizophrenia actually resulted in FDA breakthrough therapy designation, which means that the developers can communicate uh, rather frequently with the FDA in the development of this agent and hopefully get it in our hands for, use, uh, for us to use clinically in the not too distant future. There have been additional phase one studies looking at the effects of eulodorant on glucose and insulin, 
gastric emptying, and weight-associated parameters. Now, Eulodorant was tested in the phase two clinical trial in, in schizophrenia, uh, actually trials. There was a four-week randomized clinical trial, which fed into the 26-week open-label extension, which is the subject of our journal club today. The four-week randomized clinical trial involved the recruitment of patients with schizophrenia who were acutely ill, randomizing them to receive either Eulodorant or placebo for a period of four weeks, and uh, looking at the effects on the positive negative syndrome scale uh, total score, essentially measuring their symptoms of psychosis. After completion of the four-week randomized clinical trial, they were eligible to enter a 26-week open-label extension where subjects uh, received eulodorant. It was a flexible dose design, so patients initially were on 50 milligrams but could go down to 25 or up to 75 milligrams a day. This uh, uh, led to additional information about safety and tolerability, which is of great interest to us. Let's take a look at the positive negative syndrome scale total score during 26 weeks of open label treatment and look at the observed case analysis. At baseline, patients were switched if they were on placebo to open label Lorodorant. Those who were out receiving a Lorodorant uh, continued to receive it. And of the 193 four week completers, about 80% continued on to the open label extension study, and about 70% actually completed the open label extension study. And we can see that the mean change in the positive negative syndrome scale total score uh, was substantial and continued to be durable over the course of the study. Of interest is the incidence of adverse events during the 26-week open-label treatment. About 60% of patients treated with Eulodorant experienced an adverse event, but when we take a look at them, headache, uh, probably one of the most common adverse events that people can complain of, reported in about 12% of participants. Schizophrenia, insomnia, anxiety, somnolence, irritability, nausea, nasopharyngitis, influenza, weight decreased, blood prolactin increased uh, at much lower numbers here. Now, all sorts of things can happen to someone over the course of 26 weeks of receiving a, a medication, some of it be unrelated uh, as you would expect from, from a medicine. Uh, so nasopharyngitis, influenza, for example, if, if people get sick during the course of 26 weeks, no matter uh, what they experience will be you know, listed here. Schizophrenia is of interest here. Maybe it, uh, it represents a worsening or exacerbation of their, uh, their illness. But these rates are, are relatively low. The rate of serious adverse events uh, in patients treated with Lorodorant was about 5%. And the only severe adverse event observed in more than one patient was schizophrenia, not to be unexpected in a very difficult to treat condition over time. The overall incidence of uh, motoric adverse events was low, 3.2%. So this includes drug-induced Parkinsonism, uh, any dyskinesias or tremor or restlessness or whatnot. 3.2%, that, that's low. And it's not something you would expect to be so low in an antipsychotic, would you? Because we're used to seeing quite, uh, quite high rates of motoric adverse events with traditional antipsychotics. Over the course of 26 weeks, the rate of adverse events leading to discontinuation uh, was about 12%. Let's take a look specifically at weight and metabolic uh, effects vital signs and sleep quality as well. Not much in the way of change in weight. Actually, uh, minus 0.3 kilogram average weight change. In terms of uh, alterations in cholesterol, triglycerides, glucose, hemoglobin A1c, not much going on here. And overall, uh, not much going on with prolactin. So we would say that in contrast to our experiences with second generation antipsychotics have, as we've experienced them over the years, uh, this looks pretty good. No alterations in weight or metabolic adverse uh, effects of, of note here. There was improvement noted in sleep quality as measured by the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index. So the bottom line here is that we have a brand new agent that involves kind of a brand new uh, target 
one that we have not really heard about much before, trace amine receptors. And long-term treatment with a trace amine receptor type 1 agonist, Eloderont, in a daily dose range of 25 to 75 milligrams over the course of six months was characterized by people completing the study. So that's remarkable in itself. Adverse event profile is notable for the absence of motoric adverse effects, low liability for weight and metabolic effects, and no effect on prolactin. This is quite different from the antipsychotics that we've been using on a day-to-day -day basis up to now. Additional studies are needed to further confirm the long-term efficacy and safety of Euloderonta. That's for sure. And right now, this is taking place in a phase three clinical trial program. I now would like to welcome Dr. Carell to uh, join me in our journal club. And uh, first off, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this is a very interesting topic. The treatment of schizophrenia with an agent that is quite different from what we've been using for over half a century. What I'd like to ask you first, uh, Christoph, is were you surprised that this actually worked? <laughs> Great question. Well, first of all, uh, good to be here with you, Les, to talk about one of the novel potential options to treat people with schizophrenia after having had seven decades of postsynaptic dopamine blockade and modulation in terms of partial agonism. I have to say, after so many failures, and there wasn't for lack of trying, I was somewhat surprised that something so elegant and cool actually would work. I mean, it's floating around in the synapse, it's presynaptic, postsynaptic, it grabs the postsynaptic dopamine receptor, it pulls it into the cell, and it reduces presynaptic firing, where we think actually the pathophysiology of schizophrenia lies. So it would maybe carve schizophrenia at its joint. We've been treating the postsynaptic side, but most likely imaging data suggests it's not defunct there. It's not the defect in schizophrenia. It's most likely an overproduction in the presynaptic side. And that it worked in phase 2b, and we haven't shown this in the acute study, was, was big news. The effect size was 0.45. But then, I mean, what is, what is four or five weeks of a patient's life? So it was very important to show what happens beyond that. And that's the data that you've just shared with us. And uh, you haven't mentioned the effect sizes, and obviously it's an open label extension study, but there were more than 20 points in total PANS reduction after the um, endpoint in the acute study that was an effect size of 1.5. And then on the CGI, it was another full point uh, in the CGI, which was an effect size of 1. Now, again, this is under open label conditions. And there were also some patients that got worse over six months, which is expected. They might not have been fully compliant. We don't know that. But it's quite impressive that there is this further improvement over time with this novel agent that doesn't touch the postsynaptic dopamine um, uh, receptor and that doesn't have, as you mentioned, these traditional postsynaptic dopamine related, uh, blockade related side effects, prolactin elevation, Parkinsonism, akathisia dystonia, and that also is uh, free of cardiovascular side effects, which has been a problem with many of the second generation agents. Not all of them, especially the newer ones, but this seems to have no Achilles heel at the moment, either short nor long term. Right. So we saw, you know, and we didn't discuss this, the, the acute trial worked fine. And big question that we all have is it, it, it's good to treat something acutely, but really we're spending most of our time in the maintenance phase of a, of a disorder, hopefully, right? When we treat someone, uh, we hope the acute phase is brief and we hope that they remain well. Now, the, the objective of as an open label safety study is safety, tolerability, but we can also take a look at durability of effect. Were, were you, imp and you know, you mentioned the effect size of the durability of effect in terms of reduction in the PANS score. What do you think are the implications of this in terms of a maintenance treatment? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't only durability, it was actually further improvement. Now, with the caveat that in open label studies and um, with time, there might be regression to the mean and people improve further. Um, and there were 90% or 88% that didn't have a worsening of schizophrenia in six months. 
that that's quite substantial. And obviously, as you mentioned, the, the longer period of treatment is the maintenance phase. So the company will have to do a relapse prevention study to get that indication. But it looks like um, it has durability of effect, which matters to patients, which matters to families, and also to us in healthcare systems. And when we take a look at the adverse event profile, you know, I, I always wait with bated breath. Okay, when is a problem going to get, you know, prominent? But it looks like, uh, you know, just like in the acute phase or the acute study, there was no motoric adverse event issue. There was no metabolic issue. There was no prolactin issue. Are there any issues? Well, it doesn't look like it. On the other hand, these are mean scores and there might be patients who respond one way or another. There could be some people who still gain weight. Um, that needs to be looked at and we need to monitor as we would with any other uh, patient uh, on another treatment who has severe mental illness. We sometimes don't know, is it the illness and unhealthy lifestyle behavior itself? Is it the drug? Um, and we don't know whether there are some rare and long-term effects that could raise their head, um, which is why the FDA wants uh, 1,000 exposures uh, for a certain amount of time and 300 patients hit six months, 100 patients hit a year before such a drug would be approvable. And we're obviously looking forward to both the phase three data that you alluded to that look at the acute efficacy, but also more long-term and longer term data for up to one year. Well, because it works differently, do you think there's any potential for an additive effect with our more traditional treatments? That's obviously a very important question. And um, it's one that I think patients and clinicians and family members will be extremely interested in. Because as you know, as I think the audience knows, um, combination treatments are the rule rather than the exception with multiple psychopharmacologic e agents. And even two antipsychotics that have similar efficacy on the postsynaptic side are combined in one in five to one in two patients, depending on setting. And we're not really in terms of the effect sizes in randomized controlled trials, we're not seeing convincing data that this works and have about 30%, 40% who are treatment refractory with another 30% with residual positive symptoms. So wouldn't it be great to maybe target the, um, the synapse from both the postsynaptic side, but also the presynaptic side? And it might make uh, um, sense because if we block um, the dopamine receptor, these agents don't only block the postsynaptic side, they also block the presynaptic autoreceptor, which might actually increase the presynaptic output of dopamine. And if that's the case, this might be why we have to go to 60, 80% postsynaptic blockade and why some patients still have too much dopamine floating around. And in that case, it could be a rebalancing act so that there is the overproduction of dopamine that is now attenuated. It might also be that by combining the two different mechanisms of action, we can reduce the dose of the postsynaptic dopamine blockers and thereby enhancing efficacy and treating maybe patients that currently are treatment resistant. And also it will be very interesting whether there's a subtype of patients that on monotherapy with a presynaptic modulator might now respond, which previously has been a patient that doesn't respond to currently available agents. It might also be that basically the effect is neutralized by the postsynaptic dopamine blocker and there's no additive effect, but it subtracts of, from the effect of euloteron. But again, the proof will be in the pudding or in the tasting. So what do we call this? Do we call this an antipsychotic? Well, I mean, um, I'm part of the NBN, the neuroscience-based nomenclature group, and we should move away from um, um, naming medications based on their indication because antipsychotics are also used for depression and also used for mania, uh, some even for uh, other indications. So I think it would be a drug for psychosis or a drug for schizophrenia but it's certainly not in the same class as the postsynaptic dopamine blockers. It's basically a presynaptic or TAR1 uh, uh, agonist that also has 5-HT1A agonism. We shouldn't fully discount that, which might help also with the anxiety or depression in addition to the antipsychotic effect. So we would call it a drug for psychosis or schizophrenia. It could also become a drug for sleep. It could become uh, a drug for depression, 
uh, but it's a tar one agonist and that's what the who has recognized it as because it's a yolo tarond like ralmi tarond so the tar piece that mechanism of action is recognized in the stem of the word as being a novel class of medications you know we've never had to deal with this issue with treatments for schizophrenia in the past we had antipsychotics period uh, you know we we fine-tuned it to talk about first and second generation antipsychotics uh, you know trying to distinguish between those that are more likely to cause motoric adverse events versus those who are less likely to cause motoric adverse events and we left it at that uh, this opens up a whole new world though doesn't it in terms of completely different mechanism of action and perhaps we should call it something else. Absolutely. And I think in the NBN, the neuroscience based uh, nomenclature, we would call the currently called antipsychotics basically dopamine blockers or dopamine partial agonists, or we call them dopamine serotonin uh, blockers. And here, this would be a TAR1 agonist, and it's also used for schizophrenia. Yeah. So part of the, um, the advertisement for this specific journal club is asking the audience, uh, you know, to ask themselves, do they know what a TAR1 uh, is? You know, what, what, what the hell is that? And uh, it sounds so strange and bizarre. And when you look at the biology of TAR, it even sounds stranger. And uh, it really intrigued me. How was it discovered? How was Eulodoron discovered? Well, this is also a very interesting story where technology actually helps us. Um, there are now new ways of uh, doing tests on, in animals, um, in this case rodents, where you um, have multiple behavioral, um, uh, behavioral animal models that might be indicative of uh, antipsychotic effect. And basically, there was a screening that screened out any um, compounds that would have postsynaptic dopamine blockade, so that would cause EPS or prolactin elevation. And uh, there was a class of medications or molecules that actually um, led animals to behave in a certain way as if they were treated with currently known postsynaptic dopamine blockers without actually having these side effects of dopamine blockers. And it turned out that, wow, these were TAR1 agonists. Now, um, TAR1, as I think, has been uh, discovered even before that. Um, and there were also some data to suggest that there's a deficit in uh, brains of patients with schizophrenia so that th then the two uh, ways of investigation merged. So really interesting. Uh, drug development has really advanced quite a bit from just chance observation of, of patients receiving things that, you know, okay, let's see what happens now to something that's more deliberate and systematic. Uh, so it's actually quite encouraging. Uh, so, well, thank you for that. And uh, it, it's time now to turn it over to our listening audience and uh, answer questions that anyone may have. Please enter them into the box on, on, your, on your viewer. Uh, in the comments, and we'll be happy to address those questions. And uh, let's see, we have one here. If it's still ultimately affecting the dopamine pathway via heterodimers, why are adverse events so different than standard treatments? Is it all due to pre versus, versus postsynaptic differences? If so, why does that make such a difference? Well, I mean, you have to think about it in terms of the dynamics in the dopamine system. So if you block the dopamine receptor itself, you're doing something to the receptor and the downstream effect. So there is no um, efficient um, put through of endogenous dopamine sitting on these receptors. So you're blocking a physiologic effect that dopamine has. By removing these receptors, you're making the signal that's there just a, a a dimmer in a way and thereby re-regulating it without interfering with the physiologic pathway and the physiologic signaling. I think that's the main difference. And it's not just the heterodimer story, which is on the cell surface. It's also um, um, presynaptically uh, where you reduce the dopamine transmission and or, or signaling and outputs. And that I think also in, in adds to the non dopamine receptor related mechanism and therefore the effects on the dopamine receptor are not there. 
Um, now, why is there no cardiometabolic side effects? We don't fully understand the cardiometabolic uh, story. It's not just dopamine blockade. There, is, uh, there are other aspects that our so-called antipsychotics bring to bear. It's most likely some histamine blockade or maybe a serotonin blockade of the 5-HT2C uh, receptor. And that doesn't seem to be the case with, with this class of medication. Actually, um, there might actually be an improvement in cardiometabolic output and satiety signaling is, is um, modified so that there is a less uh, appetite. There is also less uh, insulin pro uh, or insulin resistance, glucose production, there's better gastric emptying. So rather than being neutral on the cardiometabolic front, it might actually have peripheral effects and some central effects that could improve cardiometabolic um, functioning beyond baseline. And we know from meta-analyses that patients who are in the first episode and even untreated with antipsychotics have more insulin resistance as well as uh, dyslipidemia signaling. So it could be potentially helpful in improving the cardiometabolic health of our patients. Well, oh, fascinating. Y you know, historically, there was a, another agent that was used that presynaptically uh, modified dopaminergic neurotransmission. That was reserpine. And it actually does work in reducing psychotic symptoms, but not well tolerated and was abandoned because it was not well tolerated. But there were some patients who seemed to respond preferentially to that. So, yeah, that's and, interesting. That's obviously an irreversible VMAT2 inhibitor, vesicular monoamine transporter to inhibitor, and that depleted all biogenic amines, including serotonin, noradrenaline, dopamine. So patients were not psychotic, but they were basically nothing from left, depressed, uh, EPS, akathisia. This is different here also because it's not a shutdown of presynaptic dopamine, it's a reduction. So we wouldn't, uh, wouldn't see that. But you're making an important point that there might be a subgroup of patients where the pathophysiology is particularly presynaptically. And if we intervene there, they might actually be helped better than even with clozapine. And we have to remember 40% of treatment resistant patients respond to clozapine, 60% don't even respond to clozapine. So we need different options. Yeah, I have another question for you, but uh, I noticed that there's another question from our listening audience. So uh, I'll defer to this question here that I'm reading for you. Thank you for this robust discussion. Would you mind commenting on what led to the rates of discontinuation? So the rate of discontinuation was around, I think, 12% or so over six months. That's very low. And I don't really know whether we even put this in the paper, what the individual reasons were. It's usually a combination of loss to follow up, could be inefficacy. I mean, there were some people who had worsening of, of schizophrenia, and it could also be some side effects. It's a conglomerate of those. Yes. Okay. So the question I wanted to ask is that there's a, another mechanism of action actively being pursued for the treatment of schizophrenia that's also um, involving presynaptic modulation. Tell us about that. Well, I mean, if you're talking about presynaptic modulation, I can only think of VMAT2 inhibitors, um, which are currently indicated for tardive dyskinesia. And so those could potentially also be used for schizophrenia per se. They haven't been uh, tried yet in a robust phase two study. And there's maybe, if you're talking about the muscarinic agonism, I see them more as interneuronal than really uh, presynaptic. And um, the front runner here is obviously CAR-XT, that is a normaline, an M1, M4 muscarinic agonist combined with trospium, which is a peripherally uh, acting anticholinergic to counter some of the muscarinic one peripheral procholinergic side effects. And here we actually now have two positive studies, a phase 2B study with an effect size of 0.75 and a phase 3 study with an effect size of 0.61. Now, how does a muscarinic agonist work um, in, in the M1, M4 story in two ways? Muscarinic 4 receptor uh, agonism stimulates the autoreceptor, and that means it decreases interneuronally acetylcholine. And by decreasing acetylcholine centrally, you're decreasing dopamine. So it's again, most likely a dopaminergic effect. However, the M1 story, it's from the frontal lobe or the cortex, um, 
is a stimulatory effect. It stimulates GABA, which is the break in the system. GABA then reduces glutamate, and via glutamate reduction, there seems to be also reduction in dopamine. So there might be a dual approach with the M1, M4, and then there is another M4 story with m which is currently being uh, developed, which in a phase 1B study. So very tiny, 27 patients in a once a day dose uh, 30 milligrams and twice a day dose 20 milligram group versus placebo. Both doses separated. And what is that? It's an M4 PAM, P-A-M. It's a positive allosteric modulator working on the muscarinic 4 receptor system. And what is a positive allosteric modulator? Our, our drugs usually work on the orthosteric site, which is the site where the endogenous neurotransmitter sits. And that either then blocks or it stimulates or it has inverse agonist activity. The problem with the muscarinic um, agonist is that there, there are five receptors and the receptors are very similar. So it's hard to find a, an agent that is, that is selective for just one of the five, which you might want. So there's also an allosteric, not an orthosteric, but an allosteric site, which is to the side. And here, when an agent sits there, it either amplifies the signal, that's a positive allosteric modulator, or it decreases this physiologic signal, which is a negative allosteric modulator. And here, again, the SPAM also worked for positive symptoms and total symptomatology. So we may have another class instead of just TAR1, a new antipsychotic or drug class for schizophrenia, which is the muscarinic agonist. That, that's actually quite exciting uh, to hear because, you know, we're used to hearing about dopamine receptor antagonism. It's been an old story for a very long time. Now we have different avenues to perhaps treat schizophrenia in the not too distant future. This is great news for us. The cardiologists have had this all the time with uh, the, the different ways of treating high blood pressure with different mechanisms to do so. Maybe ultimately we'll have the same in, in schizophrenia and we'll learn more about perhaps a potential clinical utility and combinations and so on and see where this all fits in. So quite exciting times and I look forward to more avenues to, to treat schizophrenia that were only in our imagination a few years ago. Here's a question again from the audience. Uh, you mentioned a phase three trial. Will it be head to head with a D25HT2A antagonist or further down the line, are there plans for possible combinations you mentioned to also be tested? Yeah, that's interesting. So with the Eulodorant, going back to the TAR1 agonist, um, there is a robust placebo-controlled trial program, but in one study, quetiapine is a comparator. So that is a D2-5-HT2A antagonist, and we'll see where the effect size resides there. It's both acute, but also for relapse prevention. And uh, the combination trial has not yet been studied with the Eulodorant, but it has been uh, or is going to be started uh, the ARISE study program with the muscarinic uh, 4 M4 M1 agent, CAR-XT, that is anomalin plus trospium. Here, combinations will be used. What is interesting is since uh, there is anti-muscarinic uh, efficacy through the trospium, in the combination trial program, two agents will be excluded in order not to, because there is a fixed dose of the trospium, the anticholinergic. So in those combination uh, patients, there will be no patient on olanzapine or quetiapine, the two agents that have robust anticholinergic efficacy. And obviously, since this is not a treatment resistant group, clozapine is also out. So we will get data on combinations with everything else except for quetiapine, olanzapine, and obviously clozapine. For that is for CAR XT, not for Eulodoron. Yes. Now we're we're used to seeing antipsychotics as we currently have available being used for multiple purposes, not just for schizophrenia, but also for bipolar disorder, mania, depression, maintenance, as well as an adjunctive use for major depressive disorder. It's also being examined in Alzheimer's disease and post traumatic stress disorder. Do you think there's a role for Eulodoron in other conditions? Absolutely. Um, what, was, what I was impressed by, and we haven't said it yet, in the acute study, there was also the MADRAS, the Montgomery Aspect Depression Rating Scale, used. And although patients were not selected for being depressed, so there are people who have no depression, where you can't see any improvement, and some might have a little bit, some more depression, 
there was a significant effect of eulodoron versus placebo in the overall group. So that indicates to me that there is an effect, a primary effect on depression. For negative symptoms, which also improved, it's hard to know because as the positive symptoms decrease, there's also a, a decrease in secondary negative symptoms. But I think depression doesn't change as much, it might be a little, as much with an increase in with a decrease in positive symptoms. So I think depression might be uh, a low-hanging fruit, but anything else that works for psychosis should work for agitation and aggression. It could work for psychosis in Parkinson's disease or in, in dementia. And especially in Parkinson's disease, we do not want postsynaptic dopamine blockade, obviously, to not worsen Parkinson's symptoms. Then we know that dopamine modulation helps with tics and Tourette syndrome. So that could be a potential indication. So I think the, the, the avenue is wide open once this is um, on the market. Do you think that with the advent of new mechanisms of action for the treatment of schizophrenia that we can finally eliminate tardive dyskinesia? Very good question. If we believe that tardive dyskinesia is due to too much postsynaptic dopamine blockade, which might then lead to potential um, autochthonous upregulation of these receptors, then not having the postsynaptic dopamine blockade should eliminate entirely the effects on a tardive dyskinesia. Now, the caveat is that even before antipsychotics were discovered and used, there has been dyskinesia in schizophrenia. So there is something about the dopamine dysregulation in this disorder that can give rise to motor abnormalities. So it might not be zero, and we don't really know whether it's just the postsynaptic dopamine blockade, whether it could also be other downstream effects in terms of oxidative stress, inflammation, and uh, a dysregulation of the neuroreceptor um, orchestration in the brain. So I would say much reduced, maybe close to zero, but time will tell. Well, these are truly exciting times, aren't they? Uh, we've been li living through an era of no innovation in the treatment of schizophrenia for such a long time, and now the field has exploded, and we're, we're learning new acronyms that we've never heard of before, learning new mechanisms that we've never heard of before. And even the old dopamine story is subject to revision. Uh, with these new pathways that, that may explain things a little better. It's a little complicated, and I think we'll have to hear about it more than once. I, I want to thank you, Professor Carell, for joining us today on our Medscape Journal Club, talk about Eulodoron and other things regarding schizophrenia, and, and hope uh, to have you again soon uh, on the Psychopharmacology Journal Club. Thank you so Thank much. you. I would just want to say one thing. I think we've had some innovation in terms of reducing side effects and having different modulations of the postsynaptic dome receptor, but we haven't had a mechanistic breakthrough of going beyond postsynaptic dopamine modulation. Absolutely. Uh, in, this is a quantum leap, what we're talking about. Uh, instead of incremental change, we're, we're changing our paradigm of how we think about the treatment of schizophrenia. It's quite uh, exciting and challenging so thank, thank you. you yes thanks so thank you again and uh so please join us for episode four of our psychiatry update journal club where we're going to focus on another aspect of clinical psychopharmacology that uh, we can actually apply in our day-to-day -day practice it's going to be on january 25 2023 in the new year there's the qr code to point your phone at and to register so so please do that we're going to be on a brand new platform i hope you like it and look forward to seeing you next time also please join us for medscape live in carlsbad california so uh let's have that slide up here we go December 1 through December 3 in Carlsbad, California. You can join us actually virtually as well. I'm on my way to Carlsbad as we speak. And if you're there, please say hello. <laughs>